the first talk is by our old friend Arna Koilers from University of Leuven. And the slides are already on the screen. Yeah, coming. Arna, are you ready? Yes, I think so. Yeah, you, you, can, you can see the slides. Okay, please, you can start. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Valerie. Thanks for the organizing uh, committee to organize this meeting. Um, I would have loved to be there uh, in Sochi with you, but um, so greetings from Belgium here. Uh, maybe next time uh, we can meet in person again. So um, I would like to talk about um, uh, this work that I've been doing recently with a student, Alan wrote about um, the connection of matrix valued orthogonal polynomials um, uh, that are coming from uh, hexagon tilings. And so I think it preserves, it presents a new uh, perspective on these matrix valued orthogonal polynomials, right, that have been around for a while in various uh, settings, um, mainly this connection with uh, random tilings. So there's a preprint uh, from uh, last uh, month on the archive. That's the main. Uh, Soros that I will talk about. There have been some earlier works um, with Maurice Deutz and, and with Christophe Chalier, Maurice Deutz and Jonathan Lanels that have just been published um, recently um, that discuss um, uh, two particular models. Okay, and so uh, I will also talk about those works uh, a bit. So let me first talk about these matrix valued orthogonal polynomials, right? So everybody knows uh, orthogonal polynomials, right? So you have some set X and some say weight function or a, a measure if you wish on this X and you have a sequence of polynomials, PK and K is the degree of, of, of the polynomial and you have such a orthogonality condition. Now in a matrix valued extension, these polynomials um, still depend on one variable, x or z, and uh, but their size becomes uh, a matrix. And we'll take square matrices, say p times p. And so instead of a weight uh, function, you will have a weight matrix. So it's uh, noted with capital W. And so this pk will then be a matrix valued polynomial, which means that, as I said, it's a one variable function, but it it's a polynomial, but the coefficients are p times p uh, matrices, near the degree is k. And the orthogonality that, that you want, um, that's the most uh, natural one, it turns out, is if you put the weight of matrix in the middle here. Of course, with dealing with matrices, the multiplication is not commutative, so you have to be careful with the ordering of your, of your matrices. So uh, you put the weight matrix in the middle, you put one polynomial degree k uh, on, on the left and the other one with a transpose, it turns out to be most convenient on, on the right. Um, and you ask that such an integral, which is also matrix valued. So the integral here uh, is taken entry wise. So it produces a P times P matrix. And you want it to be the zero matrix um, if J and K are distinct and, other, and if they're the same then uh, it should be uh, some uh, invertible matrix. Okay, so that's the notion of uh, matrix value orthogonality and it has appeared already in a number of contexts and people have looked at this. And so there are questions about existence and uniqueness, right? And so the most, the situation that has been considered most is when the orthogonality is on the real line or on an interval and your weight matrix is uh, positive definite uh, almost everywhere, then these then these uh, polynomials uh, exist for every uh, k if, if the moments exist also. And, and you have all kinds of properties, uh, some algebraic properties, there are recurrence relations. There may be some differential equations depending on your weight matrix W. Um, you may wonder about the asymptotics about such uh, polynomials, matrix valued when the degree goes to infinity. Um, and, and and also an important question is, uh, where do these matrix valued orthogonal polynomials appear? And so this connection with um, 
with tilings uh, is a natural extent, uh, connection, I think. And it gives also a situation where it's very natural to look at asymptotic properties because these are, this will correspond to having finer tilings uh, as we will see. So actually uh, to be uh, precise, um, the matrix variable orthogonality that comes up from these random tiling models takes this form. So it will, it's not on the real line, but the orthogonality is on a closed contour gamma here in the complex plane. Um, the weight matrix will be a rational um, function typically, and it will also vary with the parameter n, um, which sort of corresponds to the, the size of your tiling. So gamma is a closed contour. It goes around some or all of the poles of your rational uh, weight matrix. And you should also note here that um, the orthogonality here is not Hermitian, right? Uh, I didn't put any complex conjugate here. There's also no assumption here of, of being symmetric, this weight matrix. So it's, um, it's, um, it's non-Hermitian orthogonality in the matrix valued setting. Okay, that's the way it appears. And I put a two pi i just up front for convenience. So um, what turns out to be of particular interest in this uh, application to the tiling models is the so-called rod producing kernel. Okay, so uh, I won't talk much about it, but that's what will be the, um, the main character in some sense, right? Which is reminiscent of the Christoffel Dabu kernel. And indeed there is also a Christoffel Dabu formula for such kind of, uh, in this matrix value setting. Okay, let, let's now talk about these tilings of a hexagon and I wanna um, show you how these matrix value orthogonal polynomials arise. And I will do it on the, uh, uh, on the basis of this model, uh, the lozenge tilings of a hexagon. So you have a hexagon um, and it's convenient to put a hexagon like this. So with a, the side length A here, the vertical uh, side on the, on, the, on the left and here also on the right, and then B here on the bottom and on the top and the, and the side C. So you can take any integer numbers, A, B, C, and then you can uh, put uh, lozenges on there, on this uh, shape here. On, there are three types of them and they have different colors, as you see. And uh, here is a possible tiling here, right? Of, um, of such a, a, a hexagon with the sides length four, all of them, right? And there are many ways to do this, right? And so people are interested uh, by this uh, uh, phenomenon. You, there, there are counting problems, right? You can ask how many uh, ways can you, in how many ways can you do this? And also asymptotic properties, if you pick one at random, what does it look like um, if the size grows, right? If you have smaller um, size uh, lozenges, right? Okay, and this is also the question that motivates us. Um, you can do this in, a, in a several ways. You can put a uniform probability on all possible tilings, then all tiling is equally likely, but you find different phenomena if you put certain weightings on, on, on tilings. So not every tiling is equally probable, um, and the way to do this is to assign a, a weight to a tile, which depends on its location, where it is in, in, the, in the tiling, uh, but it also depends on the shape of, of the tile, right? So it's, if, it's, if it's a, a blue, a red, or, or yellow one. Okay, you choose a way to, to, to assign a weight to a, a tile, and then a weight of a tiling is just a product of the weights of all the individual tiles in the tiling. And this weighting then will be, will induce a probability, namely the, the probability is proportional to, to the weighting, right? So you divide by the, the total sum of all the, the weights, so that's a partition function to make it a, a probability measure on tilings. And these matrix valued orthogonal polynomials, they appear if you do your weighting in a certain fashion, namely you make it periodic uh, in the vertical direction. So you see here some um, 
layers, you can call them. If you go, this is one of the first layer here, and then the second and so on, you go from left to right in such a tiling. And you can, uh, uh, each tile has a certain coordinate associated with it, right? So say X, Y will be the coordinates of say the, this corner point of your, um, the left uh, lower point in the, in the tile. And then you, you assign a weighting depending on, on the coordinate, but also depending on, on the shape of the tile, um, which is periodic, meaning that if you shift your Y coordinate by a number P, that's the period, uh, then these weights are independent, that they do not move, then, right? That's the, what I mean by a periodic in the, this vertical direction. And I will illustrate how it, what, how the matrix values of orthogonal polynomials appear on the basis of this kind of weighting, which is also the weighting that is considered in the paper with, with Alan, which means that um, the weights on these yellow and red tiles are just one. They sort of are also in, in white here now. And also the, 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 the blue one is, is weight one if you, the vertical coordinate y is an odd number. And if it's an, an even number, then it is not a one, not necessarily, it, then it's some number um, which may vary from layer to layer, from column to column, but it's constant in each um, vertical, uh, in, on, on each uh, x, right? So here you have alpha one. Um, this uh, side, this uh, uh, tile has a weight alpha one. There's no other vert, uh, blue tile here on this level in this column. This one is alpha two. This one is, is on an odd uh, uh, level, right? So there's weight one, so it's not colored here. These ones have, have weight alpha three. And if you go on, you find more of them uh, all the way to the, to the left. Let me put this a bit. Um, okay, so that's the model. And, but this is just to illustrate how the matrix values of tonal polynomials appear. It, it works in, more, in a more general way. And um, it comes, uh, the, the way, the, the, they appear via an, uh, this uh, way of looking at, it, at this uh, tiling by, by means of a um, system of non-insecting paths. So any tiling of this hexagon um, is actually equivalent to a system of paths where you put some um, horizontal segment here in, a, in such a blue um, tile, this, this, this box, this, this square, and you put um, such a diagonal uh, segment in a, this is the, the, the yellow one, right? And you leave the other ones, the, the red ones, uh, they, they, don't, they have no uh, segment. And then these, uh, if you do that, then all these tiles, uh, all these segments, they combine to form paths going from starting points that are here. Uh, they just determined by the size of your hexagon and, and ending points that are over there at the end. Right, and so, and you go only to the to the right, or you go diagonally up. Right, that's what you can see uh, happening here. And then you can also put dots here in um, in red, uh, which you consider as particles. Right, and you can view it as a a, a particle system um, which has a number of levels. Right, this is the zero level, say, and then level one, two, etc. And then you can, the, the weighting that you put on tiles that you can also transfer them to the segments. Right? So this segment has a, a weight alpha one, this has weight one, one, and this is alpha two, alpha three, et, and so on, right? And so this is perfectly equivalent. And um, with this multi-level structure here come certain transitions and matrices, how to go from say z level zero to level one, you either go as I already said, uh, horizontally, or you go diagonally up, and that will then be encoded by a transition matrix. So now M denotes a level, so for example, M is zero, um, and X and both X and Y are sort of vertical coordinates, and you can go from X to Y, either uh, staying at the same level, if Y is X, and then you have a weight alpha if it's at a, an even height, and if it's at an odd height, you put one, 
how my counting goes starts at zero and then one and so on. And all the other possibilities give you a weight one. So if you go diagonally up, you get a one. Actually, if you go, if you want to go from x to a y, which is not uh, x or, or x plus one, you have no way to do that, so you put a zero here. So this is now a transition matrix, which I want to consider as an infinite matrix over the integers. So it's infinite in, in both directions. And um, because of the periodicity uh, that is assumed here, this is this matrix will be a, a block toplets matrix. Right? You, but it may vary if you uh, go from left to right. right? The M dependence is going, this is M is zero, M is one, two, three, or, and so on. Actually, this is M is one, two, three. Okay, and then any kind of structure like this um, will give rise to a determinantal point process, right? Um, there is a nice combinatorial lemma called the lindstrom kessel Vienno lemma, which is a combinatorial lemma, but in this com probabilistic context, it produces probabilities, right? And the probability to find these particles at all these locations, meaning the, the red dots here, um, at to the level M here, and the, the Y is just uh, the height that you have, uh, or the jth particle is at height Y, right? the jth particle starting from counting from below here, it will be given by a product of determinants, right? Given all these transition matrices between the, the various levels. You go from le level zero to, to the end, right? Okay, and, and so this is a product of determinants and any such probability given as the product of determinants will be a determinantal point process. Well, uh, and this was uh, discovered by Einar and Meta uh, like 1998, uh, already some time ago. And in a more general context than this, they, they give a double sum formula for the correlation kernel that is associated with uh, such a determinantal point process. So what Maurice Deutz and I uh, did uh, here um, was to rewrite this formula of ana meta in the case that where these um, uh, transition matrices are, are block tablets, right? As it is the case uh, yeah, for the tilings of the hexagon with the periodic weighting. Um, so we wrote this as a double contour integral and that's where the matrix valued orthogonal polynomials appear. So here's our formula. It's actually a simplified version of it. Uh, giving only the correlations um, between uh, uh, within one level. So there's a more general formula if you also want to have uh, correlations between uh, different levels. But okay, this is already um, too much to, to take anyway. So I just showed this formula, but I just want to point out what is the important feature here. What comes in um, in a number of places is this matrix here. Elf, this matrix um, called here W, which depends on the parameter alpha. And this is also can be identified as the, 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 the symbol that is associated with this uh, block tuplets matrix. Right? So you see alpha and one here, that's at the, if you are at an even level, you go with the probability, say alpha, you go, you stay where you are at the same level, or you go up one, well, probability or, or weight. Um, uh, you go up by one um, with a weight one. And, and if you are at the odd level, you always have one, but to account for a different block, you will put a Z here in the second row here of this block tuplets, a block uh, symbol. And here you see all these um, uh, weight, uh, these block symbols appearing here. You take a product here going um, from level M to the end in the variable W, you hear him in here from the beginning, starting at zero, going to M minus one. And they're all matrices, right? So you have to be careful with the ordering. And then in, here in the middle is um, some other matrix and that's the reproducing kernel for certain orthogonal polynomials, uh, matrix valued. And they are associated uh, with this, um, weight matrix. So you, you take the product of all 
these uh, block symbols going from the beginning to the end. Um, and you divide by a certain num power of z, right? Which has to do with the size of, of your uh, hexagon. So M, capital M, did I write it? Yeah, X, the number C, one of the sizes of your hexagon is supposed to be an even number, call it 2M. Also A is an even number, uh, it's two times N, and these M and N appear here in this, uh, uh, in the denominator there. And so you see that there's a pole at, at zero here because of the denominator and the, the matrix value to orthogonality is on a contour going around zero. So that's why it will be my gamma in what follows. Okay, so that's, um, that's the connection um, that we found with tilings and matrix valued orthogonal polynomials. And so we're going to look at this case uh, in, in more detail. And there are certain features here that are important um, just for these orthogonal polynomials, matrix valued, but also have some implication for the tilings, as I will show you. So the first observation is, uh, okay, is that um, in some cases, the matrix varied orthogonality can be reduced to scalar orthogonality. And, and this is also um, um, the point of view of uh, this uh, preprint of Christophe Charlier that is on the archive. Um, and in our setting uh, with, uh, with his, uh, his weights it, uh, that depend on the parameter alpha, it works um, if all these alphas are the same. Okay, so then let's go back. If all these um, alphas turn out to be the same, right? So then you also just have uh, um, the, the L factors here on top are, are all the same, of course, obviously, then you have an L power of a fixed matrix W alpha divided by some power of Z. And that's the situation where, where it, you can, we have this reduction to scalar orthogonality. And that's, that's what I want to explain in some detail actually. Um, but it also works if you introduce um, a two periodicity in, in, the, in the horizontal direction as well. So if you would say, well, um, an, an, an alpha with, a, with an odd uh, index is just alpha one. If it's an even uh, index and it's just alpha two, so you alternate also between alpha one and alpha two in these alphas. So then let's also assume then that L is even, then you have um, uh, this uh, expression then for, for your weight. Um, um, and then you can also have this reduction to the case of scalar orthogonality. If you go on and you would introduce three periodicity in, in, in the horizontal direction by picking alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and then uh, just go on peri periodically. Um, and, L, and L is now a multiple of three. Then you have this situation, which is, you could consider that. Then it does not work. Then you have not the reduction to the scalar orthogonality um, and I'll, I'll comment on that at the end, at the very end. But let's look at this case where all the alphas are the same, right? So you have the same W alpha at each level and you find them with uh, an exponent L now. And then we have this uh, theorem in our uh, work with, uh, with Alan Crote. Namely, um, then we have, um, well, given that certain uh, parameters uh, are satisfied. So the, the degree, I will talk about degree K matrix valued orthogonal polynomial, which is between certain bounds, right? It also actually tells us that the, the, the connection then with, with the hexagon tiling uh, exists. So then the polynomial actually exists, uh, which is not obvious from the beginning, the matrix valued orthogonal polynomial of degree K. And it can be expressed in this way in terms of certain scalar orthogonal polynomials. So that's a parameter beta that goes with this alpha, um, which is uh, this uh, formula, one minus alpha over two. So this could be a negative number if 
alpha is always a positive number, but the beta is one minus alpha over two. Um, and then um, there is this formula here that if you evaluate your polynomial PK at this argument, so zeta squared minus beta squared with beta this number and multiply with this uh, matrix, then you get a, ma a matrix with polynomials, right? That's not so hard to see. And these polynomials call it Q2, they're of the 2K and 2K plus one. They will satisfy orthogonality conditions, scalar orthogonality conditions, again, in the complex plane on contours in the plane that takes this form. So let's just look at Q2K. Oh, we can add uh, one. Um, so both of them have the same orthogonality conditions, um, but the degrees are different. And they have, again, there's some rational uh, weight function here in the zeta variable um, with a zero at this point minus alpha minus beta to the of L to, of, of order L and, and, and two poles here with, with higher uh, order. And you have orthogonality with respect to lower degree polynomials that's encoded here with this zeta to the J and J runs from zero to two K minus one. Okay, and you have a, you have a contour that encloses uh, both poles here. Okay, so let's, I was planning to go to the proof. I hope I have time, enough time to do that, but it will be uh, rather quick, I hope. But just to give you an idea where it comes from, it's not, once you know it, it's not um, uh, too difficult. Um, well, it actually comes from the spectral decomposition of your, of our weight matrix. So you have a weight, of course, it has, it, it, it's a matrix, so it has eigenvalues and eigenvectors that also depend on the, on the parameter Z. So I've, you can work it out, of course, easily with this simple matrix. Here, here it is. The eigenvalues, they, uh, you see here this, this square root appearing. That's what's called zeta before. And this matrix of eigenvectors here, I put the eigenvectors, uh, of course, they are in the, in the two columns. Um, um, and you'll see that in, in the terms of the, the value zeta, will be uh, related to, to, to Z in this way, as, as it was also done before. And um, you will see then that, that the matrix E here actually can be written like this, one over, well, the first column has the one and zeta plus beta, and here is the second column, and the inverse is like that. Right? And, and this actually is, is this uh, extra factor that you have here uh, on, on the right here of this matrix valued polynomial, right? So that, that's where it comes from, right? Otherwise you may think, where, where did you get this uh, thing from? It's from the eigenvectors of your weight matrix. And so then you can, uh, well, you can call this uh, product here uh, Q, uh, 2K, well, it's easy to verify that the first column has these monic polynomials and, and the second column has these, um, the same polynomials actually, but evaluated at minus zeta and instead of zeta, which comes from this minus zeta, of course, here. And zeta squared is, of course, invariant under going from zeta to minus zeta. And as I said, then this other factor here is just the matrix uh, with the eigenvectors. And so you can then uh, plug this into your orthogonality. You have pk times w alpha to the l. and uh, Z to the K here in the denominator is in this, I combined it with, uh, with Z to the J, right? This is the way to, one way to write the, the matrix orthogonality. This is a zero matrix for every J running from zero to K minus one. And then you can uh, uh, plug in these formulas that we had. PK was this matrix with the Q polynomials times the, um, times E inverse, right? So I put this E uh, to the other side. And then uh, W alpha had, was this uh, factorization, right? And then you plug it in. You see that E and E inverse uh, uh, cancel out once. And this product here is just uh, written like this, right? You have this matrix with the Q polynomials, the scalar polynomials, the eigenvalues to the power matrix of eigenvalues to the power L and, and the rest, which is E inverse. So then you change variables in this 
uh, integral, you, you deform your contour so that it is big enough. You change variables from z to zeta to zeta. So then, because it's zeta squared, you, you pick the, the root that is uh, has positive real part. And the condition is an integral then over a semicircle, right? Uh, and then you observe that uh, you have, an, this is a matrix valued, you have four entries here, which are all zero. And each integral either contains um, the weight uh, like this um, evaluated at zeta, that's when lambda one is involved and the other entries involve lambda two to the power L, but lambda two zeta is basically lambda one evaluated minus zeta. And so you have this, 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 this weight function coming in in zeta and in minus zeta. And you have conditions that involve either this one or that one. In the ones that have minus zeta, you change zeta to minus zeta. And then you see that you get an integral over the other semicircle and together you get an integral over the full circle. And that's where the full orthogonality comes from, right? The scalar orthogonality. Okay, this just to give you an idea where this comes from. You can also look at this, this scalar orthogonality uh, from the point of view of the Riemann Hilbert problem that's associated with matrix valued orthogonal polynomials. And that's actually the point of view that uh, Christophe Chalier takes, uh, but you can also do it just by hand in, in this way. Okay, so, so once you have scalar orthogonality, of course, then you have a, a lot of tools. I mean, in particular, if you're interested in large N asymptotics, large degree asymptotics that, that, that many of people in the audience will, will know and have worked with. Um, and so here you, um, the little, I put now little n here, which is associated with the size of the hexagon. And here you have these scalar orthogonal polynomials. They're orthogonal with respect to this weight. Now I, I changed zeta to z in this uh, slide here and in this uh, section. So you can look at this kind of orthogonality and um, with uh, the degree of the polynomial take it to be n, which corresponds to the, the parameter here in the weight. So we have varying weight with n, but this is a situation that has been discussed a lot, right? And the zeros of these polynomials will tend to a, a curve with the S property, right? In some external field coming from the varying weight. So this has been looked at a lot uh, since the, the, the 80s by Gonchar Rachmanov, Stahl did fundamental work there. Others, Abtikarev, Sutin, Martinez Finkelstein, and, and many others. Sorry if I don't mention you. Uh, and you can look at this a nice paper um, by Martinez Finkelstein, Rachmanov, do orthogonal polynomial stream of symmetric curves. So the symmetric curves uh, refer to this S property. So I will not talk a lot about this S property. In this case, you can calculate everything, right? The, the zeros turn out to be lying uh, for n going to infinity. They tend to a contour, which is a critical trajectory of a quadratic differential that, you, that one can comp compute explicitly. Here it is. Oh, there's a Z plus and a Z minus, sorry about that, a typo here. Um, they are explicit formulas in terms of alpha, which I didn't put on a slide because it's, uh, it's, it's quite long and not so informative, I would say, but you can look in the paper to see what it is if you're interested. And you see that there are uh, three double uh, poles here of the quadratic differential, a double root, double zero as well, and two simple uh, uh, zeros, the Z plus and Z minus. And the critical trajectories, they go from, from Z minus to, to Z plus here. And this is one of them. There's another one, which is maybe nicer. It, it, that's a part of a circle even, but it doesn't attract the zeros. This one attracts the zeros, right? As we, as we show in our paper. Actually, we have to restrict to the situation where the parameter alpha is bigger than one over nine. And we also restrict to less than one, but we could, could go all the way up to plus nine if we want to. So if um, we are in this range of alpha bigger than one over nine and less than one, then there is such a 
correct differential, there is such a uh, critical trajectory. And there's a, a probability measure associated uh, on, this, uh, on this critical trajectory, which has this form, which is very standard for people that, uh, that know this stuff and have worked with it. And this will turn out to be the, the limit, the weak limit of the zeros, in the sense of the weak limit of the counting measure of zeros. And actually, we have a stronger result, which is a strong asymptotic formula for the polynomials. Um, which uh, involves the so-called g function here, the function little g is the main character here. That's this logarithmic trans, uh, transform of um, this uh, probability measure, right? Which is um, also the main uh, term here in, in, this, uh, in this formula. There are some prefactors that are explicit as well in terms of this z plus and z minus. And I've written it down here, not only for QNN, but also for slightly shifted the degree. You may also consider degree N plus K where with some fixed K, which could be also negative, an integer. So why did I do that? Well, actually I did it because we need this formula, not only for, for K is zero for QNN, but also for K, Q N plus one, right? And then there's an extra factor coming in depending on this K. Okay, so that's um, one thing we, we did. And why is this condition uh, one over nine uh, important? Actually, it's, it's actually a crucial condition because um, there is a facialization there at alpha is one over nine. And it's nice to see this in terms of the tiling because uh, if you take a typical tiling here with this weighting that we have with the parameter alpha, and if alpha is less than uh, one over nine, and if uh, your size is, is pretty big and you take a regular hexagon here, then, and I've slightly deformed the hexagon, right? To make it really look like a, a, a regular hexagon. Then you see some interesting features. There is some fixed pattern here on the top and the bottom that is very common in this kind of models, but you also see a very fixed pattern here in the middle where you alternate between certain, um, between two tiles they're colored differently now, actually. Uh, they're going, but from left to right, you have this, uh, what I call a staircase here pattern. And if alpha is bigger than one over nine, then you also have this staircase pattern, but it doesn't continue all the way from left to the right, right? So somehow it is broken in the middle and these disordered regions here, which are in the limit, they will become two ellipses here. In this model, uh, if alpha is bigger than one over nine, they get merged and they find you get a more complicated a region of this order here in the middle. And this is reflected in the behavior of these uh, polynomials, right? I won't say more about that uh, due to lack of time. How much time do I have? Um, okay. Um, I have five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, that should be enough. I'll, I'll, I'll be quick. So you need did, a few minutes for the questions. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So if we look at now, what does it mean? Now we know we can pretty much do everything for the scalar orthogonal polynomials. What does it do for the matrix polynomials? The matrix valued orthogonal polynomial. Well, one quantity you may want to look at is, is the, the determinant of the matrix and which is also a polynomial, it's of the, has degree two N and look at its zeros, right? And this, because of our explicit expression here, it is this formula in terms of the scalar orthogonal polynomials. That's the determinant and of your matrix. Uh, and Z is again related to zeta in, in, the, in the way that we had it before. And then we can look at where does, what does it mean for the zeros of the determinant? And we get this, um, result that the zeros of the determinant tend to a curve, which is just a transform of our curve sigma zero that attracts the zeros of Q, just because of the way the transformation goes from zeta to Z, right? And so here's a picture then of this uh, curve that attracts the zeros of the determinant, um, right? And so that's, that's a calculation. Once we have the formulas for the scalar orthogonal polynomials, it's, it's not really uh, a big deal. But you see that there's some overlap here and yeah, the, 
that's why I'm crossing here all these curves, right? So that is a nice picture, I think. And just out of curiosity, we also looked at the zeros of an individual entry of this matrix. And we took the one, two entry because that has the simplest expression in terms of the scalar polynomial. So we took the one, two entry of our matrix. That's a polynomial degree uh, n minus one or, or less. And um, it has this um, expression in terms of, of the polynomial in the, in the zeta variable, right? Again, there's this change of variables. And then we found these pictures. Um, so if we took, uh, here's again our curve sigma zero tilde that attracts the zeros of the determinant, but the zeros of the, the entries, they go differently. They go, there's a lot of them on, on, on the imaginary, on the real axis, actually negative real axis. And part of them follow this, uh, this curve here. That's quite curious. And if you look at this combination of these scalar polynomials, right, that is related to the one, two entry after the scale change of variables, then you find zeros that are mostly on the imaginary axis. And a few of them uh, are here. They follow this piece sticking out into the right half plane of this sigma zero and its mirror image uh, that you have in the right half plane. And that's actually what we proved that this is the case pending a condition. And we could not prove it in without any restriction. We want, had to assume a certain condition equality for the G function, namely this one, that somehow it's bigger uh, in the left half plane compared to the right half plane. And then we can prove, uh, we can find the limiting distribution of the zeros. We also found uh, the formula for the, the weak limit of the, of the zeros. And, and this condition actually is, we could prove this condition on an asymptot on a geometric assumption on our sigma zero, which is very reasonable. All the plots indicate that it is uh, satisfied. Namely that if you have sigma zero and, and you also take min minus sigma zero, uh, then the two of them will uh, un enclose a bounded domain omega zero. And the, the two pieces here that stick out should be in the interior of a omega zero, not in the exterior, right? It's confirmed by all our experiments, but we could not prove it. But once this geometric condition is enough to have this condition on the real parts of the G function. Okay, maybe I stop here. Um, I have some conclusions, but maybe somebody wants to ask a question about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now questions. Are there some questions from the audience in Sochi? Questions from um, online participants? I have some questions for your fast transition. Um, the picture that you show yeah. Could you, uh, with your uh, calculation, could you reconstruct it or it's a result of uh, Charlier and other people? Sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Um, picture about phase transition. The, the, the phase transition, yeah, for the- Yeah, phase, sorry, well, this yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, this one, you mean? Or? Yes. Is it your result or result from yeah, this the, is, uh, people from uh, Charlier? This is in our paper with Christoph Charlier, Marius Deutz, and yeah. we, we took a different point of view, not via the matrix orthogonal polynomials. There's another way to look at it. They go directly to the scalar orthogonality. Uh -huh. And um, and then uh, we we could describe these pictures indeed. And, uh, and we, we prove that indeed uh, the phase transition is there. Okay. Thank you. No questions? Thank you once more again. Okay, thank you.